So Thursday, we're going to deal with plant anatomy and growth. So today, we're just dealing with conservation and change. Easy enough. It's depressing. This is a very, very particularly depressing one. So we're going to talk about threats. We're going to talk extinctions. Then what can we do about it? Although I already told you about the study guide, so moving on. Bunch of objectives. The biggest threat to the world seems to be humans. We seem to be quite stunning in that regard. And one of the things that we worry about is what's going on with biodiversity. So it helps if we deal with the term biodiversity. We gave a metric, which was the diversity index. That was that h equals the negative sum of pi times the natural log of pi, where p is just the proportion that species is in whatever area you're looking at. So that is just what we would call an, a species, bless you, biodiversity. But there's other versions of biodiversity that exist. One I heard about. What podcast was that? I don't know. One of my nerdy podcasts I listened to dealt with a genetic biodiversity bit. And it was looking at the fungi that we use to make um, cheese. And for some of the designer cheeses in Europe, they're dying out. Because the fungi are so uniform, they have such little genetic diversity, that changing of conditions, such as Europe having differential temperatures that it's not used to having, it's killing off their fungi, and it might collapse the French and Italian cheese markets. Because we've lost genetic diversity. So... It's one of those where sometimes some of these seem rather esoteric, but there can be financial consequences to these. So genetic diversity is what alleles exist. So this, we don't care about genes. The genes are going to be the same. This is looking at the allele diversity. Species, obviously, that's the Shannon diversity index. But we could also look at biodiversity in terms of ecosystems, because each ecosystem is going to be unique. So we have e unique ecosystems, each with genetic and species biodiversity, too. We should probably care since we usually thrive on diversity. Most of our drugs come from what's the G? Plants and fungi. And if we're killing off or reducing the plant and fungal diversity, we're losing out on possible treatments for things, which is not going to be particularly fun. Another one that some people worry about. I don't have the mental ability to like really fully grasp how big of an issue this is. But if you look at the European, Amer Amero, European, however you'd phrase that, diet, Americo, Euro diet, it's based on something like two dozen crops. and most of everything that we eat, is relatively limited. And if you look at where, where we grow our food, we basically get rid of anything that looks weird, meaning it doesn't match the food that we want it to look like. Anyway, it's an interesting series of books. The, the TV series was okay. I... Some of the visualizations, I was like, oh, well, they should have had, and no, they didn't, whatever. So in terms of biodiversity, we do know that there are patterns that exist in nature, especially when we start looking at latitude. So the closer we get to the equator, 
what we see is there is more transpiration. We see that there's more precipitation. We see that the temperatures are far more stable. So we're thinking of tropical forests. And there is a pattern between evapotranspiration and species richness, meaning the w more we get evaporation, the more species we get. You can find the exact or plot the exact same trend when it comes to precipitation. We can plot the exact same trend to a degree when it comes to temperatures, or at least fluctuations in temperatures. And they all start pointing to basically the equator as high biodiversity or as high diversity. The moment we start moving away from there, diversity decreases. So if we want to see the lowest diversity, look at the poles. Highest diversity, look at the equator. We also happen to know that if we have bigger spaces, you get more diversity. Increase space, increase diversity. We know this last one dealing with area by looking at islands. I, I don't know if this is a symbol you all know. It means correlates with. Meaning if you make one go up, the other one goes up. So if I increase area, you increase diversity. If you decrease area, you decrease diversity. As you make islands bigger, you get more diversity there. This scale here is also a fun one because it's what we would call a log scale. So this is not a normal looking graph. Typically when you see things like this, this has nothing to do with this class. It's more of a, here's how visualizations work. Things that use log or natural log, what we're trying to say is we're manipulating the visual. So it looks nicer. So if you're ever in a class where they make you graph something using logarithms, it's not because they wish to torture you. It's because it's going to make a prettier picture. And that's the only reason why we do it, just because it makes for a prettier picture. Because if we didn't, this thing would look like a big exploded mess that you probably wouldn't be able to read most of the data. So using logarithms, we need to make a nice, pretty straight line. We are a threat because we are very good at moving pathogens around. I don't think we need to deal with much past uh, that one that I highlighted. If we didn't go insisting on having food brought to us from places that maybe we shouldn't be getting food from. We wouldn't necessarily have had all the fun that we had for those two or three years. Do any of you know what this is? Uh, it's a picture. This is due to something called the pine beetle. I don't remember from which country it was imported, but it was brought on over and our conifers can't handle it. And it made it so, what, decade ago, five years ago, if you remember, like all of the mountains were catching on fire. It's because the beetle killed all the trees. And if the trees die, they're just basically firewood standing. And all you need is one of them to catch fire, and there's nothing to stop it. So we've introduced pathogens that aren't necessarily just for us. We've introduced plant pathogens too. Whenever you introduce pathogens from an animal, we refer to that as a zoonotic transfer. 
that just means an animal is giving something else. The virus. We give viruses to things. Things give us viruses, meaning animal to animal, but we also can transmit to plants. Turns out it's also how a lot of plants pick up their viruses. They just need animals to move them around. We've introduced some other fun things too. So we've introduced some species. So I pointed out things like viruses. This here is a vine from Asia called kudzu. It is beautiful. So people in the Midwest said, oh, we love the way it looks. I want to put it in my garden. There's nothing here in America that knows that, oh, I can eat that plant. So the plant grows everywhere. And we can't kill it. It is too good at growing. And since it has no natural pathogens, oops, it overtakes everywhere it goes. There's another plant that we love to plant that you shouldn't plant at all. And it's one that you know. And that's bamboo. You never plant bamboo. Because bamboo, it's a, it's a grass, which is kind of weird to think of bamboo as a grass, but it's technically a grass. It is one plant. So if you put one stalk of bamboo into the ground, it will grow everywhere. And unless you rip all the soil out, burn all the soil, and replace, you're not going to get rid of the bamboo. So if you want to have bamboo, you need to put it into a pot. You need to trap it. Otherwise, it will grow everywhere. It's an introduced species that, under the right circumstances, is okay, but under the wrong circumstances, will wreak havoc on whatever place you put it. Because we don't happen to have, like, pandas running around eating all of our bamboo. Obviously, we burn down stuff. We over-harvest. Most famous of the over-harvesting -har occurs with what I had last night for dinner. Yes, fish. But sushi's so good. It's just so good. And then industry with pollution. Is this an American-only thing? Nah. Japan's known for dumping, like, tons of mercury into the ocean. Just because, where else are you going to put it? Okay, put it into the ocean. It's not going to do anything. Mercury... When you add it to a bacterium, forms something called methyl mercury, which is an organic mercury. And this thing here turns out to be horrifyingly toxic. Like if I had a jar of mercury and said, here, hold out your hands, and I poured it all over your hands, I mean, it's going to hurt because mercury is heavy, but it's not going to do anything to you. You heat it all up and start huffing it because you're weird. It might cause some neurological damage, you know, a couple decades down the road. If I take about five milliliters of methylmercury and I were to just, you know, drip it onto one of your fingers, it would kill you. It would absolutely kill you. So again, I can have gallons of mercury, real mercury on you, nothing. Five mils of methylmercury, you're dead. How do we make it? It's all an industrial byproduct. In terms of introduced species, this is looking at, I believe, if I remember, these are urchins. There were some urchins that were introduced to Australia. And they moved, they're native to mainland. Tasmania, because it's an island, usually you keep things separate. But they were brought on over because who doesn't want to eat some urchin? And the result is they have spread out and they are destroying all the kelp. And because they're far enough away from their native range, there's nothing there to stop them. And we've already dealt with Australia and like rabbits and cats and stuff like that. So. So ultimately, what we're going to do is we're going to start driving populations down. 
And when you start driving them down, we're going to run towards extinction. So what's extinction? When the population cannot increase or maintain its numbers. It does not mean that they are no longer existing. Extinction is you cannot maintain your population. I point out to you the northern white rhino. There are two. There's two left on the entire earth. They are extinct because they're both female. They're done. It is an extinction by the inability to maintain themselves or increase their numbers. It has begged a philosophical question, which is can you de extinct something? I don't know enough to really have an opinion, although I have thoughts, but they don't mean anything. So one of the ones that people have thought about trying to de-extinct is the Tasmanian tiger, which is also called the thylacine. So it was the largest carnivore in Australia and Tasmania. And it's basically, think of like a really large coyote is how to think of them, but they had stripes on their back. So they functionally behaved like they were tigers, even though they aren't tigers. They're marsupial, so they have the little pouch and all that stuff. And much like the carnivorous um, marsupials, they have like these freakish jaws. I don't know if you've ever seen like a Tasmanian devil open its mouth, but it can open up about like that. So you say, oh, that's not that big. Try opening your mouth this wide. You can do it. You just need to, you know, do a little joker thing and you have to tear your your uh, mouth open to do it. Or you need to be a hippo. If you're a hippo, you can pull that trick off. So if you look it up, you can look up what the Tasmanian tiger looked like with its mouth open. There is one video that was made of the last one. It was kept in a zoo in Hobart, which is in Tasmania. They were hunted to extinction. Yeah. They were hunted to extinction because we were convinced that they were eating sheep. And all the ranchers said, no, 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 we don't want these things killing all of our sheep. So we're going to kill off this, these Tasmanian tigers. There was never any evidence that they were killed, that they were killing sheep. So we killed them off because we thought they were doing something without any evidence whatsoever. So the last video of of ever made of a thylacine. It was the last one that we knew to exist and it was just kept in a cage and it was just someone with this newfangled technology called a video camera and took a video using the camera and you just watch this thing just pacing in a space that might be the length of this table. It's horrifyingly depressing. And as far as we know, it's the last one. If you go to... Tasmania, there are people who are called cryptozoologists. I don't know if you've ever heard of a cryptozoologist. So crypto means hidden. So cryptozoology is the science of the hidden animals. You know of cryptozoology because you've heard of things like Sasquatch and the Yeti and Bigfoot. Those are crypto animals because they're out there you just don't believe and there are people who have spent their lives absolutely convinced they have seen thylacines it's quite shocking I'm not saying that they're wrong that there's like even of like bigfoot that all the pictures you ever see of bigfoot the definitive evidence is always blurry. It always looks like, so this photo was taken by someone who is inept, and this is like a 
flash photo camera from the 1960s. Have you always noticed that? Which is always strange given how all of us walk around with a movie camera on us at all times. And it's always the crappiest videos of them. Mm, just saying. I don't know. We have taken tissue of them because there's several uh, taxidermid samples. And people are trying to figure out, can we bring them back? And would be using, I think, the Tasmanian, the devil as the surrogate to try and attempt to bring them back. We're trying to do the exact same thing with the northern white rhino, since, again, they are basically extinct. We're trying to do the same thing with the dodo. What's the closest relative to the dodo? Pigeons. Pigeons are the closest relative, because dodos are pigeons. They're large, stupid, flightless pigeons. But we know of other large, stupid, flightless pigeons. So people are trying. One that people are also definitely trying is the mammoth. These things, we might reckon, like they might recognize where they're from. Thylacine, we could recognize where they're from. This thing's environment doesn't exist. Its, it's, it's ecosystem has gone extinct. So bringing it back, I don't know why you'd be doing that. Because basically you're bringing it back for torture purposes. This also made the news like two months ago. Because we have enough of its genome that we can effectively reconstruct it. And people artificially made a mammoth burger. Because you can 3D print animal protein. So the question then became, so what did it taste like? Because that's the thought you immediately had, not how horrifying that is. It's, so is it good? And the answer is, no one took a bite. Because we don't know how we would react to it. What if it has proteins in it that you are allergic to? So, in the name of science, I will have this mammoth burger, and then you die. <laughs> like, it's... I don't know. Other one that's famous, it's called the Baiji, which is the Yangtze River Dolphin. These were last seen something like 25 years ago. So, a lot... The, of all of these, this is the newest one that we think has gone extinct. Um... People would capture them and say, look, look how amazing this is. I found this rare dolphin. And then they'd eat it. We weren't sure how many of them existed to begin with. River dolphins are insanely rare to begin with. They were usually slaughtered by boat propellers or people hunting them. The, also, just for the sake of saying it, this river... I don't know if you know where the Yangtze River is, but it's in China. It's one of the most horrifyingly polluted rivers that exist. So even if us hunting them and then slashing them to death with propellers didn't kill them, we just basically like polluted their homes and probably poisoned them out too. And they were known, like all dolphins, to be super helpful to humans. So if you were around a dolphin, especially if they're river dolphins, and you fall into the water, for whatever reason, they're usually like, oh, they'll swim up to you so you can grab onto them and they'll swim you to the shore. Dolphins, if you go into the ocean, if there are sharks nearby, dolphins will start surrounding you and start pushing you away. And you're like, why are you doing that? It's because they're trying to protect you from something that they perceive as a threat. Why? Because we're the stupid intruder. And they're like, oh, it's the silly little thing that's kind of awkward in here. Let's go save it. We think that, oh, look how nice they're being. No, they're like, oh, you, sweetheart, you're so dumb. And they're trying to help out us lesser beings. The way extinctions happen is you need to enter into something referred to as an extinction vortex. So. An uh, extinction vortex is basically this. Once a population reaches what we know as a minimum viable 
population size. Minimum viable population. What that means is the smallest possible population that maintains biodiversity and can avoid extinction. Once we dip below that, and the way you find it is you have to go below it. So it's, it's kind of like carrying capacity. You know when you hit it because you've gone and screwed up. How do you know the keystone species? Because you've gone screwed up. How do you know when you hit the minimum viable population? Because you've gone screwed up. What we see that happens is when you have a small population, your options decrease, which means inbreeding increases. Inbreeding causes a depression in biodiversity. Also, because it's a small population, we get genetic drift. I don't know if you remember what genetic drift is. But genetic drift is basically we lose patterns. So when you have a large population, you can predict what will happen with what's going on with genes over time because large populations show statistical patterns. Small populations do not show them. They just reveal the randomness of this thing saying, no, I don't want to work anymore. It also shows the randomness. Oh, it's now totally gone. So genetic drift is you can't predict what's going on with the next generation. Inbreeding. We're losing diversity. Well, both of these result in the loss of genetic variability. And what that's going to do is make it harder for the next generation to survive, which means the population is going to decrease, which is basically what we have here. And once we have another smaller population, there'll be even more inbreeding, more genetic drift, which means less possibility of surviving, which means even fewer are going to be born, more are going to die, which shrinks the population even more. And once this kicks in, basically you can't stop it. So it spirals down more and more and more and more and more until extinction happens. Without any outside intervention, assuming outside intervention is even a possibility, you're done for. The thing that makes this also difficult is when we say population, not everyone counts. So we have what's known as an effective population. An effective population has to do with individuals who are capable of reproducing. So if you have individuals who are sterile, you don't count. If, you have, if we're dealing with mammals and mammals have a menopause, or at least some mammals do, not all mammals turn out to have menopause, but if you're a mammal that has menopause, sorry, you don't count. If you are before the age of reproduction, you don't count. If you, I don't know, have, if you're currently pregnant and you can't have two pregnancies at the same time, sorry, you don't count. So we have lots of ways that you exist in the population, but you are eliminated from the effective population. Which also further complicates this. It's not as straightforward as how many are there. Because you also need to ask, what are their ages? Can they reproduce? Are there other things that are influencing them that might prevent them from reproducing? In the Midwest, there was some wild bird. I can't remember the name of this one, but it doesn't matter. It's from the Midwest. 
that we had seen over the years it actually decreasing in numbers and what researchers did in the mid 90s or early mid 90s is they inserted new birds and these came from a neighboring location so they're not the exact same species but they were close enough And it was enough to cause a slight rebound. Because the only real solution to escaping an extinction vortex is you need to introduce individuals who have diversity with them. It's the only option you really have. Because outside of that, you're kind of done for. If you went to if you worked at a zoo and you wanted to increase the cheetah population. Cheetahs are just a famous example of this. You can't just say, oh, male cheetah, female cheetah, are they siblings? No. Sweet, let's pair them up. You can't do that. That's not an option. Almost all animals in zoos, we have a genetic profile of them, and an outside agency who doesn't know any of the animals just looks at the genetics and say, mm, nope, not a good pair. However, this individual here and this individual from a zoo on the other side of the world, they are really far apart genetically. They get to pair up, which is why if you go to zoos, you often hear of like, oh, here's a brand new animal and it came from somewhere in France or it came from another zoo in Maine. And you're like, but there's a perfectly good one right there. And it's because... They're trying to increase the diversity amongst the animals. Otherwise, their own populations will fall into an extinction vortex too. Obviously, humans, we ruin environments because when we move into an area, we want to build our houses and we want to then have our shopping malls and we want to have our roads and then we want to have everything else that we want. So then the question becomes, well, who wins? Is there space in California? Have we run out of room in California to build homes? That's what you hear. People talk about how we ran out of space. We have no more space in California. Have any of you ever driven outside of Southern California? What do you notice the moment you get out of LA, Orange County, Riverside, or at least part of Riverside, part of San Bernardino, part of San Diego. There's a lot of space. There's a lot of space. The catch is, do you want to move there? No, because it, it's hot, and then it's gross, and it's far away from stuff, and it's gross. And also, did we say that it was hot? Because it's hot. Also, what if there's something that's endangered there? Because... There's a lot of things in California that are endangered. So you find a spot that's actually somewhat nice. You wish to build a home there. Well, there's something that's endangered that lives there as well. So who wins? You or the endangered thing? You listen to people or politicians, they'll tell you things like, who cares about the stupid fish that are in lakes up in Northern California? The farmers need water. Because our needs are more important than the fish. Why are our needs more important than the fish? Which isn't saying that I'm, they are. I'm just asking why is that the case? Usually we'll come to some type of compromise if we don't just flat out obliterate stuff. And we will start to fragment whatever is going on with the environment. And when we fragment, we start to get what we call an edge effect. The edge effect is when you have two ecosystems that are next to each other. Under most circumstances, what we'll get is an increase in biodiversity. 
like where saltwater environments run into freshwater environments. You get an estuary and we get an explosion of biodiversity. That would be a normal edge. When they are artificial, they usually result in a decrease in biodiversity. Namely because one of the two sides is going to negatively impact the other. What does that look like? Fantastic question. There are some canyons. So what's the edge? The edge would be, well, we have this street, and then we have the property lines, because, you know, we can own plots of land and stuff. We have this area here. Then you have all the wild space around it. Probably black was not the correct color. Let's make it... There we go. Oh, oh. This we can see. And hopefully a little plot over there. All of that turns out to be where we would have an edge. Everywhere where there's blue, that's introducing an edge. Where we're going to have whatever diversity is here. And then you have diversity here. And typically it's some type of negative impact. With an edge, the way that they normally work is organisms can move back and forth and they're fine. The catch is, what happens when you have, I don't know, a mountain lion that introduces itself into the human area? What do we do to it? We kill it. How about the bear that comes running on, coming, moving on in and it says, ooh, look, you have food inside of a dumpster. Let me start rummaging through. What happens to the bear? We kill it. We can go this way just fine. Uh-oh, until you came across that rattlesnake. Now what do we have to do that rattlesnake? We got to kill it because, you know, I came into its territory. And how dare it be pissed at me? How dare it? If it comes near my place, damn right I'm going to kill it. I mean, how much do you freak out when you go inside your bedroom and there's a spider near where you sleep? How dare it? Come near your very sacred dwelling. That sucker, it never had a chance. It was dead before it even knew that you were there. This type of artificial edge does not mirror natural edge effects because one side is actively killing the other side. Sometimes we do it because, you know, you want to have a place to live. Sometimes we do it because we're like, hey, let's have some food. So this is obviously a clear cut. There's a problem when you clear cut forests. And that is, usually the forests, when they're really big, these are climax states. Which is to say it's really mature because there hasn't been a lot of disturbances. The result of this is it's nutrient-poor soil. So clear-cutting for places to grow food is actually kind of the dumbest of the dumb because you're picking an area where food intentionally is not going to grow, which means we now need to add fertilizer which then leads to eutrophication. And even then, the soil probably won't do too well with that fertilizer, so after about two or three growing seasons, nothing's going to work. So you just kind of say, eh, oh well, and you go clear it, cut some more forest. Why would you need to clear cut the forest? Because they need food. What food are they wanting to grow? 
Do you know why they clear cut? Or you know when you don't want to say? It's for cattle. Why for cattle? So you can eat them. Why do they want to eat cattle? Because we eat moo cows. And tell me, do you like the taste of the moo cow? Yeah, moo cow, tasty. Piggy, tasty. Cluck, cluck, tasty. We like how they taste. And it's kind of odd that we like to say, yes, we love eating what we do, yet you find out in Brazil that they're clear-cutting the Amazon so they could have more cattle. And we say, no, don't you dare. Don't you dare. Why are you doing that? That's dangerous. You, should, you can't get rid of the biodiversity there. It's important to keep the Amazon. Well, what do we do to all of our forests and all of our grasslands? We clear cut those right on down so that we could have moo cows. We're allowed to do it, but you're not allowed to. This is natural. This would be a natural edge. Where whatever's going on in these grasslands can move on into the forest area, and whatever's in that forest area can move right on back. This is natural, and this would lead to an increase in biodiversity. Do you know what it's called? I mean, there's no reason why you would. Of these loopy things, what those are called inside of a river, they naturally happen. They're called meanders. So whenever you have a, a river that does that, it's called a meandering river because it's just twisting back and forth. And eventually what these will do is they'll lock each other off, and you get lakes that are horseshoes. They're called oxbow lakes. And then eventually they turn into a meadow. How does all that happen? Ecological succession. So adding of the chemicals, we've dealt with eutrophication several times before. The scarier one, as I ate tuna last night, is biological magnification. So biological magnification is a hard idea, even though we get it, but like if you had to explain it, it's, it's just kind of a hard thing to explain. It was made famous by a book called Silent Spring. Silent Spring was written by a woman by the name of Rachel Carson. The book dealt with DDT. What's DDT? It's a let's kill the mosquitoes chemical. Why are we killing off the mosquitoes? Because who the hell wants to be bitten by mosquitoes? Kill them off. The catch is DDT undergoes a process of biological magnification and it ultimately decalcifies bird eggs. Bird eggs, when they're decalcified, if you sit on them, because you're a bird, they go pop. And it made it so the eggs could not handle the weight of the parents. And you, we were killing off the birds, which is why it's referred to as Silent Spring. Because imagine spring without birds, because we were killing off the birds. From this book, which again, if I don't like you, read it. It is not an easy book to read. And again, it's not the topic, it's just how it's written. It's, it's just a hard, hard book to read. But because of that book, we banned DDT in this country. And the birds came back. Which is why, like, half of the world's countries still use DDT. We could do stuff here, but at last check, water kind of goes everywhere. So that kind of sucks. How much plastic do you consume? I heard just the other day that you eat about a credit card's worth of plastic every month. I don't chew on credit cards. I didn't say you did. 
just from the water you drink. Like, have you ever checked your drinking water to see if it's free from microplastics? Do you check to make sure that whatever moo cow you're eating or piggy piggy oink oink or cluck cluck you're eating is devoid of plastics? We've had parents give birth. People have then taken the placenta and said, I wonder, examine it under a microscope. They see plastic inside the placenta. That's only possible if there's plastic in the bloodstream, which means you had to absorb it from the food you consumed. What's that doing to things? Well, one thing that we do happen to know is plastic is an artificial estrogen, and it's leading to sperm not functioning. If you were to track plastic use and male infertility, the correlation is perfect. Is it a, is it a regression, like correlation cause, is it a causation? Well, we can test this out. We just need some guys who are willing to test as a volunteer. And since you, I don't think ethically you can do that, we just have the correlations to go off of, and they are terrifying. Then obviously, greenhouse gases. The way the biological magnification works is our producers are going to absorb some bit of it. So they can absorb mercury, for example. Here, these are fluorocarbon or fluorocarbons, but you can use this for any type of organic molecule. You can do this for mercury. It doesn't matter what you want to pick. The smallest things will absorb some of it, but not enough to kill them. Something's going to eat it. All of these things that we worry about, like these compounds that we can put inside of organisms or the mercury that we worry about, they're all going to be organic, which is going to be code for lipid soluble. What food is the tastiest, lean or fatty? Would you rather drink like whole milk or fat free milk? Would you rather eat a hamburger that's 99% lean, which is to say a turkey burger, or do you want like Moo cow burger. You always want the fattier things. The fatty things have flavor. Would you rather have fat free ice cream or real ice cream? Bring on the ice cream. These things here dissolve in fat. And when times are tough, as you burn your body, burn off calories, or you have to reduce your body fat, all these things do is they become more concentrated in your body fat. Where you can go from having a low toxic level because you had high body fat, but if your body fat drops enough, you can reach a toxicity level where now it's killing you. And as it moves from one trophic level to the other, it builds up more and more and more in body fat. And the result is, after enough rounds, you can have high enough levels that we start to get physiological damage, such as decalcifying the eggs, or in our case, with our love of mercury, your brain doesn't work. Or we can turn off your pancreas, or we can turn off your liver. And once they start to turn off, you don't really get the option of turning them back on. Because we don't really have a good way to get the mercury out of you once you put it in. Which is a shame because swordfish, have any of you ever had swordfish? Oh, it's so good. Swordfish is so good. And it's like one of the worst that you can ever possibly eat. The only things that are really worse would be um, whale and shark. And conveniently in this country, both are illegal. That's why for like half the world's population, they're not illegal. Uh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. How can we fight back? Well, we can try and be green. We can try. We can build our electric cars, ignoring how horrible it is to build an electric car and what it does to the environment 
when you go and strip mine, but we ignore that. Um, we can make nature reserves. We can make national parks because it automatically in most countries protects the land. We can try and fix things if we damage it, put it back. A lot of research institutions work on this. We can even have things called UNESCO sites. So these are United Nations declared heritage sites, meaning for the good of existence on Earth, we should have these. There are several that turn out to exist. If you wanted to go and visit all of them, I would tell you good luck. There's like 3,000 of them. The one that I wish to visit is this one. It's in Australia. So Australia is a box. I don't know if you know this. Uh, people live here. People live here. There's some people who live like here. There's a few weirdos up here. Yeah, that's where Australia, all the populations are. The one I went to go to is right um, there. It is about 12 hours away from the nearest, 12 hours of straight driving from the nearest human being. You usually have to bring your own gas with you because there's no other option. In particular, this is called Shark Leaf Bay. And it is home to these things. You look at me and say, are those coral? No. Are they rocks? No. They're called stromatolites. Oh, I've heard of stromatolites. Those are like the things that hang in caves. That's a stalactite, as opposed to the spiky thing called a stalagmite. Stromatolites are layers of cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria, once upon a time ago, were engulfed by a pro-eukaryotic cell, and they gave us the chloroplast. These are the living ancestors of the chloroplast. They form these structures that are like a foot or two tall, and all they do is they go, and that's it. They just make bubbles. They are found in two places on Earth. In large numbers, they're found in two places on Earth. The Bahamas and Shark Reef Bay. Fossilized stromatolites, do I have a picture of it? No. Fossilized stromatolites have been aged to about 3 billion years old. which is about the age of eukaryotic organisms. We can trace these back to the origins of life itself on Earth. And you can visit them. You can't touch them, and they're always found in really shallow water that, has a, that doesn't have tide changes, and the temperature is usually pretty calm, and there's usually nothing else that really lives there. If you can find those spots, you can find these stromatolites. They're on my bucket list before I die. The problem is, you got to get to that spot, and good luck to me. So outside of like saying don't build stuff that's dangerous and don't touch it, what else could we do? Well, we could do things like wildlife crosses, crossing points. In California, super liberal, ultra left-wing California, we finally got funding to build our first wildlife crossing for a freeway. We can avoid polluting. Easiest way to do that, public transportation. Shifting consumerism would be a big deal. The problem is your phone starts dying, what, six months after you buy it? You already need to have a new one? Not because you want a new one. Literally, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, we can try and fix the area, or we can try and improve it, which is what biological augmentation is. Don't care. 
we know we can do this because we've done it before. The California condor, we brought them back from extinction. You can visit them. We have a national park where they're naturally found. It's called Pinnacles. We've done it to, with the African elephants. We've fixed it with the ozone. We used to have massive holes in the ozone layer. And then the world said, oh, that probably is going to be bad for us. And we fixed it. All we have to do is be convinced that we need to fix it. And we can fix it really fast. The problem is we don't want to fix things. The next time, we're going to talk plants. <laughs>